This program includes audio descriptions for the visually impaired. A park ranger stands at the edge of a graveyard near a white wooden church. Hello, good day, and welcome. It's really good to have you here. I am Ranger Nathan Hall, and really happy to be given this tour here today. Uh, one of the reasons I'm really so excited to give this particular tour is that this is a tour that we couldn't have given 15 years ago. Um, and five years ago, this is a tour that would have been entirely different than it is today because of all the new information that we're sort of finding about this subject. And I want to kind of jump right into the beginning of this story. If you've heard this story before or some version of it, this is probably what you heard. This is from Harper's Monthly Magazine, June 1911. This is an article uh, titled Miss Van Loo about Elizabeth Van Loo, the Union spy in the Confederate capital during the Civil War. The greater part of military information received from Richmond by the Army of Potomac was collected and transmitted by Miss Van Loo. And importantly, it says her method, quote, of reaching President Davis in his least guarded moments is evidence of her genius as a spy and a leader of spies. The Van Loos had owned a Negro girl of unusual intelligence. Several years before the war, she had been given her freedom, sent north, and educated at Miss Van Loo's expense. This young woman, whose name was Mary Elizabeth Bowser, was now sent for. She came and for a time was coached and trained for her mission, and then in consummation of Miss Van Loo's scheming, she was installed as a waitress in the White House of the Confederacy. What she was able to learn, how long she remained behind Jefferson Davis's dining chair, and what became of the girl after the war ended are questions to which time has effaced the answers. So the question of this tour is, is that story true? Who is Mary Elizabeth Bowser? You'll notice the title of this tour is A Black Union Spy in Richmond Who Was Mary Jane Richards? Um, are these two the same person? Um, well, follow along with me. What I'm going to try to do is basically give you all the evidence in chronological order. I'm going to show my work, so whenever I mention something that happened, I'll tell you how and why I know that. There's three different kinds of information we're going to be talking about on this tour as I try to unpack who this person is as well. One of them is going to be things that I can tell you with absolute certainty are true. There are also going to be things that uh, come out in this story that I can tell you with absolute certainty are not true. And there's going to be some stuff in the middle. There are going to be things that have some probability or possibility of being true. I'm going to try to give you uh, the best tools that I can to kind of make an assessment for yourself or an evaluation of whether you think uh, some of these claims are persuasive. Um, but if you've heard this story before, if you Google Mary Bowser or Mary Elizabeth Bowser, you're really going to be seeing that story from Harper's Monthly in 1911. The starting point of our tour today is right here, St. John's Church. The reason that this is the starting point is that this is the first clue primary source that we can follow to try to find the answer of, is Mary Elizabeth Bowser a real person? The first bit of evidence, the first clue as to who this person might be, we have is a record of a baptism here at St. John's Church. The date is 1846, May 17th. Uh, the records indicate that someone named Mary Jane, quote, a colored child belonging to Mrs. Van Loo. Mrs. Van Loo is Eliza Van Loo, the mother of Elizabeth. So this is our first hint of a name that we might follow through the historical record. In the 1850s, uh, there's evidence that uh, Mary Jane Richards is educated, goes to school in Princeton, New Jersey. On Christmas Eve, 1855, someone named Mary Jane Richards departs New York City on a ship bound for Liberia. And we have uh, records of the American Colonization Society that she goes there. And we have correspondence between Elizabeth Van Loo checking in on uh, Mary Jane Richards to make sure she's okay. And it turns out she's not okay. Turns out young Mary Jane isn't very happy with that. And the, uh, Elizabeth Van Loo actually asks the Colonization Society to arrange to have her return. Uh, so it is March 5th, 1860. Mary Jane Richards is on a uh, manifest as arriving from Liberia into Baltimore. From Baltimore, she'll come down here to Richmond. Now, 1860, things are really heating up in uh, national politics, of course. Um, we're going to have a presidential election coming up, which is really going to uh, 
have a huge effect on American history. July 7th, 1860, the census taker is doing his rounds here in the Churchill neighborhood in Richmond. Over on that corner, the census taker arrives to the home of Elizabeth Van Lu and writes down that there's a young woman, age 24, named Mary Jones, living in the Van Lu house. Uh, this young woman um, is listed with an M. Uh, the term is mulatto at the time. So this is a person, you might say, biracial or mixed race today. But do we know this is the same Mary? If so, why is there a different name? That's another one of these historical questions. Also significant to me is that there's a little box on that census form that ticks whether the person is literate or illiterate. The Mary Jones listed in the Van Lu house has the box ticked saying that she is illiterate. Um, now we know for a fact that Mary Jane Richards is definitely educated and literate. Um, so are these two the same person? Well, there's a couple more clues that'll show up in quick succession, uh, again, to let you know in the spectrum of what is definitely true, definitely not true, and maybe um, let you kind of make your own estimation here. We're going to leave St. John's here for a moment and go to the next place where we're going to find the clues as to who Mary Jane really is and whether all of these different Marys uh, might actually be the same person. Come along with me and we'll go to our next stop. The ranger is standing on a busy city street beside a large brick courthouse. All right, welcome to our second stop. The building behind me was built in 1896 as the Henrico County Courthouse. It's here in the city of Richmond. Uh, predating that was an earlier Henrico County Courthouse and Henrico County Jail. August 20th, 1860, the newspaper says a woman named Mary Jane Henley was arrested here in Richmond for the crime of, quote, perambulating the streets claiming to be a free woman of color. That woman, Mary Jane Henley, was put into custody. Now there were actually two different jails in Richmond at this time, the summer of 1860. There's the Henrico Jail right there on Main Street in downtown Richmond. And there's also what's called the City Jail. Um, Today, that's located where the on-ramp to the interstate is, right next to First African Baptist Church, Monumental Church. So I don't really have any way of knowing which of these two jails that Mary Jane Henley was uh, taken to after her arrest. But there's one site here that I can visit here in downtown Richmond. Uh, the other's a little bit harder to get to being uh, in a median in the interstate. But uh, one of these two places is where this person was held for a couple of weeks. Eliza and Elizabeth Van Lu, in the summer of 1860, were uh, in the western part of Virginia um, when Mary Jane Henley, quote unquote, was arrested, placed into jail. After some time in jail, Mary Jane Henley, according to the paper, changed her story and said, my name is not Mary Jane Henley, my name is Mary Jones. So the last thing we see in the newspaper is a little notice uh, that Eliza Van Lu was fined $10 for allowing her slave, Mary Jane, to go at large. The newspaper noted that the young woman was arrested, uh, given the name Mary Jane Henley, then gave the false name Mary Jones, and the newspaper said her real name is Mary Jane Richards. So we now have three different names in one story for this person who is here at the jail. The really important thing to note for the purposes of this story is that, uh, as we've established, this person that we can established is Mary Jane Richards, did go to Liberia and did come back. It is against the law in Virginia for a free African American to come into this state. If you are enslaved and you get your freedom, you are required by law to leave the state. If you are free, you cannot come back, ever. The penalty for coming to Virginia as a free African American is you get arrested and you can be sold into slavery. So, when Mary Jane Richards is in this jail, under the name Mary Jones or Mary Henley, um, if nobody comes to get her, she will be placed in a state of slavery. However, if Eliza Van Lu, a wealthy white woman of Richmond, Virginia, shows up to that door and says, let her out because she belongs to me, that's the only way she can get out of jail. So what we can establish here is that that's a lie. Eliza Van Lu has said, this young woman, Mary Jane Richards, is enslaved to me. Uh, and can be therefore released. She cannot be released if she is a free woman. So we have the beginning of really telling a lie in order to get out of jail in this instance. 
And just in the process of researching this tour, I found an interesting little tidbit that um, warrants a little further um, research. September, Mary Jane Richards gets out of jail, having already given the name Mary Jane Henley and Mary Jones. In February of 1861, a few months later, in the Richmond Anzeiger, the German language newspaper here in Richmond, has a little notation that says, Mary Jones, a free woman of color, was sentenced to receive 20 lashes for striking Melinda Perry. That's the entirety of that article, but a free African-American named Mary Jones, I don't know how many there might be here in Richmond, but is run afoul of the law again uh, in the early part of 1861. This is right in the middle of the secession crisis. In November 1860, Abraham Lincoln is elected president. In December, South Carolina votes to secede. Other states follow. Virginia does not, but the news here on Main Street is what is going to happen. Is there going to be a war? Is the country going to split? That's what's going on at this time. In April of 1861, at the state capitol in Virginia, they vote on secession, and they vote no. Virginia votes not to secede. On April 12, 1861, Confederate forces fire on Fort Sumter, and that officially begins the combat. The Civil War has begun on April 12th. On April 16th, four days later, back where we just were at St. John's Church, there's a record of a marriage. Wilson Bowser, it says, a servant in the home of Mrs. Van Loo married Mary, quote, no last name given, also a servant in the home. Now, the name Mary Bowser for the first time actually exists. If we're trying to figure out who this person in the 1911 story is, there now uh, is somebody named Mary Bowser because someone named Mary in the Van Loo house has married someone named Wilson Bowser. I will also note that this is the only time in any historical record that I have that someone named Mary Bowser exists. That's April 16th. The next day, April 17th, in response to Fort Sumter, Virginia votes to secede from the Union. And the next month, this place is going to be declared the capital of the Confederacy. Our next step, we'll talk about what these women, the Van Loo ladies and Mary Jane Richards, did for the cause of the Union in Richmond during the Civil War. The ranger is standing outside at the edge of a parking lot. The place that we're standing now is right beside um, what's known as the Ross Factory. This Ross Factory was in the 1850s a tobacco factory. Um, by 1860 it had become something different and unusual. This had become the uh, Ross Hospital for Slaves, as it was advertised. For the purposes of this story, it's important to note that there are no Unionist spies in Richmond in the summer of 1861. The war's just starting. I think everybody's kind of crossing their fingers and hoping this thing settles itself pretty fast. Over that first summer, you have the Battle of First Manassas, or Bull Run, and Main Street right here becomes entirely filled with the dead, the dying, and the wounded. Uh, Confederate and Union soldiers brought here into the city after the battle, a city that is in no way prepared to receive them or accommodate them. So the city is desperate to find places to put all of these people. They have uh, set up hospitals in some of the old tobacco factories for Confederate soldiers. A real challenge is what are you going to do with the Union soldiers? Many of the very pro-Confederate people don't want the Union soldiers sick and prisoners even in this city at all. So what kind of naturally occurs is these two buildings right here on Main Street, you have Franklin Stearns, the wealthy Unionist, you have the young E.W. Ross, they offer their buildings for the Union soldiers. So the Ross factory for slaves becomes the Ross uh, prison hospital and prison for Union soldiers. So the people who are naturally Union supporters are offering up their spaces to help care for the Union wounded. So right here, on this street corner is also where Elizabeth Van Loo and Mary Jane Richards come in that first summer of the war to visit prisoners, to give them blankets, to give them food, to give them books to read. I'm going to read from that post-war speech given by Mary Jane a little um, sort of accounting of what happened here. 
Mary J. notes that after McClellan's seven days fight, the Southerners took pains to bring their own wounded into Richmond with all possible dispatch and at the expiration of a week had brought the wounded Unionists. They brought them in common wagons and pitched them on the sidewalks. They did that for three successive days. They brought them in and threw them down, she says. This she had seen with her own eyes. If a person were to speak to these prisoners or to hand them a glass of water, it was castle thunder for them. That's the Confederate prison here in Richmond. One of the two Union women in Richmond, Mary says, was a delicate Southern lady, rich, well-known to the Confederacy, who resided in a splendid white mansion in that city. Hmm, who could that be? She didn't name names. Uh, this lady, she says, disguised herself as a beggar and visited these prisoners in the company with the speaker, Mary Jane. Why, Cousin John, they would say, addressing one of the prisoners, the Confederate guard looking on meanwhile. Why, Mr. So-and-so, how came you to get into the Union Army? I'm ashamed of you. The rest was easy, for she, the speaker, never knew a Yankee that couldn't take a hint. The guard grumbled somewhat, but the speaker being only a beggar, all passed off to their entire satisfaction. So this is what uh, she's describing uh, as coming to visit the prisoners. This is kind of an interesting thing to note because there's this myth that grows up after Elizabeth Van Loo dies, and only after she's dead do people start using this term crazy bet. The idea that this wealthy white woman walked around the streets pretending to be crazy, and that's why she was able to kind of come and go as she pleased. We have no evidence, no primary source that says that that really happened during the life. The closest thing we actually have is this little speech, um, but it's not, as you can see, describing her pretending to be crazy. It's really just describing her pretending not to be her. There's already, even in the summer of 1861 and in 1862, suspicion about these women uh, and what they're doing. So that, that first summer of the war, they're visiting the prisoners here in this makeshift hospital block. Um, that second summer of the war, you have the huge battles, the seven days battles, nine miles from Richmond, uh, a week of constant fighting, which absolutely fills this city with wounded and dying. And at that point, uh, the city of Richmond is realizing that these makeshift facilities are not enough and they are converting larger spaces to be massive hospitals. Belle Isle, the island in the James River, will be a, a prison for enlisted soldiers and then a gigantic over on Cary Street uh, becomes Libby Prison. That's going to be our next stop to talk about how the war escalated from the point of view of more prisoners being here in Richmond and the war escalated from Elizabeth Van Loo and uh, Mary Jane Richards here going from helping prisoners with comfort to helping prisoners not become prisoners anymore. Follow me and we'll go to that next stop. The ranger is standing beside a large concrete wall with a plaque that says Libby Prison. We are standing really right next to the entrance of the Libby Prison. As you can see from the old photograph, this was essentially three warehouse buildings connected that took up most of an entire block. As the Confederacy expanded, as it moved on to those big battles, going to the Seven Days, to Second Manassas, Antietam, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, into Gettysburg, as 1862 became 1863, here in Richmond, it just filled up with people related to the Confederate government, and every time you have one of those battles, hundreds more Union prisoners, and not many places to put them. This giant warehouse became the uh, place that housed Union officers. Also, that office right there on the corner, that front entrance, was the processing spot. So basically, every Union prisoner that came through Richmond of any rank came down Carey Street here and had their name marked in a ledger in that front office in the corner at Libby Prison. In the photograph I'm showing you are the three people who ran that prison. There pictured is the clerk. That's the guy with the ledger in that office. He keeps track of the Union prisoners coming and going. He is in charge of counting how many Union prisoners are in there doing their roll call. Guess who the clerk is? E.W. Ross, the guy who owned the slave hospital and a friend and associate in the social circle of Elizabeth Van Loo. So as the war progresses and this prison system matures, it's pretty handy if you're a Union supporter, you have one of the Union supporters actually in charge of counting the Union prisoners. This kind of helps with the graduation, getting to realizing they can help get those prisoners out and use people and means that they know to get them back to the Union Army. And th this is one of our primary source quotes, and this is from Elizabeth Van Loo writing in her diary in May of 1864. Uh, what she said was, when I open my eyes in the morning, I say to the servant, what news, Mary? 
and my caterer never fails. Most generally, our reliable news is gathered from Negroes, and they certainly show wisdom, discretion, and prudence, which is wonderful. Um, now, what this tells us with some certainty is that Elizabeth Van Loo, who is by now collecting information um, with the intention of helping the Union, is that she acknowledges how useful it is to have uh, African Americans that can move around the city and collect information that she cannot. Um, our question as historians is when she says, I wake up every morning and I say, what news, Mary? Is this the same Mary? We know from the census that someone named Mary lives in the house. Someone named Mary got married in 1861 to Wilson Bowser with no last name mentioned. Someone called Mary Jones was in the census in 1860. Um, to what extent we can call this all the same Mary is kind of up to you. Now, think back to that 1911 Harper's story that says Mary Bowser worked in the Confederate White House, was in Jefferson Davis's dining room at his chair. Now, start to evaluate whether you think that is true. The way I think about it is, if this is the same Mary, Elizabeth Van Lu says, when I open my eyes in the morning, I say, what news, Mary, and my caterer never fails. What that tells me is that this Mary is the caterer at Elizabeth Van Loo's house. If she opens her eyes in the morning and Mary is there, she's probably not at Jefferson Davis's house. Now again, when we think about this Mary and all the different names that Mary uh, might have, uh, in the midst of Libby Prison getting set up, the war escalating, the Van Loo people helping Union prisoners get out, we have in the court records of Richmond someone getting a new registration as a free person of color. Mary Jane Henley, in February of 1863, says she lost her old papers and gets new registration as a free woman of color in Richmond. Now that's really telling to me because the only other time we see that name Mary Jane Henley is Mary Jane Henley getting arrested and immediately giving two other names and getting released as Mary Jane Richards. So we know the name Mary Jane Henley is just a fake name. So as the Civil War is kind of reaching its zenith for the Confederacy here in the uh, city, we see that fake name pop up one more time. That also means the last record we have was Mary marrying Wilson Bowser. That's the only Mary Bowser we have in the historical record. Now we have Mary Jane Henley popping back up, and we're never going to see the name Mary Bowser again. That's February 1863 into 1864. At the end of 1864, in December, a man escapes from here, Libby Prison. He left, he made it to the safety of Union lines thanks to the help of Elizabeth Van Loo and her espionage network and uh, probably surprised them by reappearing in Richmond two weeks later. And what he had was a note from General Benjamin Butler of the Union Army and a secret code and a bottle of invisible ink and an address to write to General Butler under a fake name. As of December 1863 and into January 1864, Elizabeth Van Loo, Mary Jane Richards, all the people in their network are now officially employees of the U.S. government. They have graduated from being secret unionists to people assisting union prisoners with aid and comfort to people helping them escape. They are now officially spies. As we go to our next stop, we'll take you to January 1864 and see how things progress as these folks have now officially become government agents. The ranger is standing in the garden behind a large gray mansion. All right, welcome to the next stop. We are, as you can probably see, at the wartime home of Jefferson Davis. So when it comes to the legend of this story, the 1911 Harper's Monthly story, uh, this is the centerpiece of the story. Mary Elizabeth Bowser, supposedly, working under the nose of Jefferson Davis in this house. Um, as we follow kind of the thread, uh, it finally takes us here. This is an excerpt from a speech. This is after the end of the Civil War. It appears in a newspaper called the Anglo-African. The headline says, Richmonia Richards. That's apparently the name of the person who's giving this speech. It says, this lady delivered an interesting address on Monday evening, September 11th, at the Abyssinian Baptist Church. Miss Richards commenced by referring to the fact that she was born in Virginia that she never knew who her parents were, that she was taught in her infancy that she was not a slave, but would be brought up intelligent and educated and then sent to her fatherland to instruct the natives there. She accordingly sailed for Africa and arrived safely in Liberia. Miss R was walking out one evening when she was met by a patrol who inquired for her pass. Not having one, he took her to the calaboose and the next morning she received five lashes. 
she was finally sold into slavery. Now, what we follow with me, we have the records from the court and the newspaper to show that Mary Jane Richards came back, was apprehended for not having a pass, uh, and ended up in jail. What we know is absolutely not true is that she was not sold into slavery. So when we look at what we know is true and what is not, you're seeing uh, sometimes these things actually get mixed together. Um, now, continuing this speech, it says, while in this servitude, she became known to the Union League in Richmond and performed many important secret services for the Union cause. She went into President Davis's house while he was absent, seeking for washing, and while there was conducted into a private office by one of the clerks when she opened the drawers of a cabinet and scrutinized the papers. While thus employed, Jeff came in and inquired up to her what she was doing there, but considering she was colored, allowed her to go in peace. She left Richmond last fall and went to Fredericksburg where she aided in the capturing of a large amount of tobacco and two rebel officers. That is Richmonia Richards telling the tale in October 1865. I guess the important thing to think about in deciding whether you think that's true or not, first of all, it's a long way from that Harper story 50 years later. You'll notice the person who wrote that story didn't contact someone named Mary Jane Richards or anybody like that to confirm the story. They said she's been lost to time. So the primary source of that is not this person. This is a primary source. This is somebody that I would say is pretty definitely Mary Jane Richards, somebody who went to Liberia and came back got arrested for not having a pass, and was in the secret service of the Union. These are all things that we can say are true. You get to decide whether you believe that she went into, and that's the door she would have gone down, down that back staircase. Below that iron staircase is the back door. It's a long way from the Harpersby story. What she does not say is that I worked in this house. She specifically says she does not. I went to the house looking after some laundry, and she actually says a clerk let her in. And we do know that Elizabeth Van Loo had some people who were in the Confederate government offices in her uh, kind of confidence. But again, this is on the spectrum of things that I know are true and I know are not true. This is in the middle. Right now, I don't have a way, I don't have some clerk's diary that says I let this woman in the house. So uh, this is not the kind of thing that we can as historians say is absolutely true or absolutely not true. Again, there are things in here that we know are not true. She said she's doing this as someone who was sold into slavery. We know that that's not the case. So she's mixing in some truth and some untruth. That is the one and only primary source that says the person we know as Mary Jane Richards, that Harper's in 1911 knows as Mary Bowser, went into that house. Part of history is looking at the evidence and evaluating it. If it's something you can't know is true, you get to decide how persuasive or convincing you think that story is. By the time Harper's was published in 1911, Jefferson Davis was dead, Elizabeth Van Loo is dead, and as far as we know now, nobody knows where Mary Jane Richards is. So there's nobody really to uh, check on this story. Um, one of the questions then we haven't really addressed is who was telling that story in 1911? A Annie Randolph, Van Lu Hall, or Annie Van Lu, was a little girl. She was roughly age six to ten during the Civil War. She did live in the Van Lu house. So she's remembering that a woman named Mary Elizabeth Bowser lived there. She said she disappeared at some point during the war. Maybe that's when she was working for Jefferson Davis. So now I'm asking you then to think about the source and imagine something that happened. If you are the right age, something that happened 50 years ago. Try to think back to 1970 and think of somebody who worked with your aunt and how much you can tell me about their life and their story. How many details do you know about it? That's the kind of uh, length of distance we get for this 1911 story that is the origin of all this. Um, so when it comes to like how we evaluate that evidence, you have two different things. You have a 50-year-old story from Annie. You have a primary source story from September of 1865. They have certain elements that very broadly fit together, but in the, for the most part, they don't. Now, there's one other person. Think about this. If you're a historian, you want to find out whether this Mary Jane Richards, Richmonia Richards story is true, or whether this Annie Van Lu story is true from 1911, how would you find that out in 1911? You wouldn't ask Jefferson Davis. He's dead. You wouldn't ask Elizabeth Van Lu. She's dead. Um, if you went looking for Mary Elizabeth Bowser, you wouldn't find her because that 
is a completely made up name. That's the wrong name. We know that. So you're never going to find her. Um, one thing they did ask was somebody else who lived in that house. Verena Davis, Jefferson Davis's wife, wrote to Isabel Maury, who was the regent of the Confederate Museum, as in that building was full of Confederate artifacts in 1911, and the woman running that place um, asked Verena Davis, I saw this story about uh, a African-American woman being a clever spy uh, working under your nose in this White House. What do you think of that? This is Verena Davis's quote in response to that. I never had in my employ an educated Negro given or hired by Miss Van Lu as a spy during the war. My maid was an ignorant girl born and brought up on our plantation who would not have done anything to injure her master or me. That Miss Van Lu may have been imposed upon by some educated Negro woman's tales, I am quite prepared to believe. So that's an interesting quote, right? First of all, it lets you know that Verena Davis is aware of who Elizabeth Van Lu is and was during the war, and you can really see what her feelings about her are. Um, what's fascinating to me is this is a denial that really isn't a denial. The Harper's story says that Mary Elizabeth Bowser worked in Jefferson Davis's home, what did it say, as a maid or was in the dining room. All Verena Davis has done is deny that her personal attendant came from the plantation. So she's really, she's expressing that she does not believe the story, but she hasn't really offered even a very specific denial that this person, Mary Jane, uh, may have been in the house. Um, so to the extent that you could ask anybody who was alive and could comment on it, they did. They got a response that really isn't actually very helpful for an historian. So kind of a non-debunking. Uh, but so as for the primary sources that place Mary Jane Richards, a Union spy in this house, you have seen it all. The 1911 story, everything you're going to read on the internet um, is essentially built on from that. If you Google Mary Bowser, you're going to see that story and it's all going to be from that source. The only other potentially corroborating source to that Harper's story you might see is an accounting uh, of somebody called Thomas McNiven, also being a Union spy during the war. The source on that is a man named uh, Robert Waite, who remembered in 1952 telling the story about how supposedly his mother remembered that her father, Thomas McNiven, was a spy and totally backed up the whole Mary Elizabeth Bowser story. Um, ultimately, that's a story being told way, way after the fact, third hand, and also doesn't say anything that wasn't already published in the Harper's story. So as historians, we really, we never use it uh, because it doesn't really offer anything that's corroboratable in anything that wasn't already said somewhere before. April 2nd, 1865. That's when Jefferson Davis left this house for the last time. Richmond was evacuated by the Confederates. On April 3rd, the Union Army was here in Richmond, and up those stairs, the Civil War was over, and slavery ended forever in the former Confederate capital. Our next stop is where I want to take you to show you what happens to Mary Jane Richards now that she is no longer employed as a spy for the federal government. She's got to do something, and there are a lot of opportunities starting on April 3rd, 1865, that did not exist the day before. The ranger is standing across the street from an Italianate church building with wide front steps and four large columns. We are here at the Ebenezer Baptist Church on Lee Street in Jackson Ward. Um, this is a church that had been established in the 1850s and existed in 1865. By April 22nd, there's someone named Mary Richards teaching at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Richmond. Judging by its very italian y kind of look, um, I'm guessing that this is a post-Civil War building, but the Ebenezer Baptist Church, a frame structure, was here in 1865. Within a couple of weeks after the Confederates leaving, Mary Richards was acting as a teacher. Now, she's not apparently a teacher here at Ebenezer or here in Richmond for very long because by the end of the summer, we see in the records of the New England Freedmen's Aid Society that she has stopped by and visited their office in Boston. By September and October, she's in New York City. And the way we know that is from these two speeches which appear in the New York City newspapers. There is a speech in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, dated September 25th. And it says, a young lady of color, Miss Richmonia St. Pierre by name, related some of her adventures and experiences to us. Um, around that same time, 
as I mentioned in the Anglo-African, a woman named Richmonia Richards relates her stories. Now this is, again, on the spectrum of what we can say is true and not true, this is the same person because she's telling, in essence, the same story. About eight o'clock, Miss St. Pierre entered the church and took a seat on the platform. This is interesting because we do not have a photograph of this person. We have here a physical description. She's a good-looking woman of about six and 20, in height and general appearance strongly resembling Miss Anna Dickinson. They might indeed easily be mistaken for twin sisters. But there is no known photograph right now, as of 2020, of Mary Jane Richards, this person that we know. If you have already Googled or are going to Google Mary Jane Richards, or you're gonna Google the Harper's monthly name, Mary Bowser, you're going to get an image. This is an image which is Definitely, very provably not the person we're referring to. This is not Mary Bowser. This is not Mary Jane Richards. Um, there's a really good article by Lois Levine which goes into all the precise details. Suffice it to say in this limited setting that this is among the things that we can say very, very sure. It's a name, it's a picture of somebody who is named Mary Bowser, who lives in Petersburg. It's a picture clearly of in clothing that if you kind of know historical clothing is not of the 1850s or 60s. It's 1880s, 90s, turn of the 20th century clothes. We know that by the time that photograph is taken, this person, Mary Jane Richards, has gone through a lot of names. She's not Mary Bowser at that time. So categorically, this is a photograph. If you see it, we know it's not her. We don't have a photograph of her. And here's where we will talk a little bit about maybe why she's not a teacher here for very long. She's telling this to an audience in New York, far away from the school, far away from their headquarters in Boston. While by the New England's Freedmen's Aid Society, she was not treated with anything like the proper consideration, which was owing, she supposed, to her color being a little darker than theirs. She complained bitterly of this. In concluding, she advised all those who could go south as missionaries among the free people, not to talk sympathy so much, but to do something for their colored brothers and sisters. While talking about that, there was one thing she must mention. The bayonet has been put in the hands of the Negro. Another thing yet remains to be done. He must have the ballot. She was half afraid that Northern abolitionists would do nothing more than talk, and that if the colored race would not obtain justice. Justice must be done to our race. Do us justice, she said in conclusion, almost unintelligible in the excitement into which she had worked herself. Do us justice, or I say, look out, look out, else el insurrection worse than anything that has yet taken place will be the result. After a few more words, she sat down. That's something really amazing. So for many, many years, if you read the fantastic book, Southern Lady, Yankee Spy, about the workings of Elizabeth Van Lu during the war, this is all information that wasn't available then. It's only in the 21st century, really, that this has sort of become available to us. We now know not only so much more about this person, making them less mysterious, but we have, it's a secondhand account, but we have an accounting of her own words about what she did and her own opinions about uh, navigating the time of slavery, the time of post-Civil Richmond. I want to uh, take us back to St. John's Church for our conclusion. Having left the New England Freedmen's Aid Society and left Richmond teaching here, uh, gone to New York, given her speeches, she now appears in St. Mary's, Georgia. That's a little town right on the border between Florida and Georgia. And she's working for the Freedmen's Bureau, operating a school there. So there's a bit of correspondence between Mary J. Richards and the superintendent of the schools. Also around that same time, March of 1867, there's a little article uh, in the American Freedman from a Reverend Cramond Kennedy. And he says, I met this woman, Mary J.R. Richards, and uh, she told me this amazing story about how when appearing as a slave, she was in the Secret Service of the U.S. And in that exchange also was Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote about that uh, in her diary as well, who witnessed this. So the kind of train from the Mary Richards that we know here in Richmond to there is pretty clear that she showed up in St. Mary's, Georgia, running a school and telling people, including Harriet Beecher Stowe, the story of being an operative uh, in the Civil War. Then in June of 1867, she wrote to the superintendent, I met a guy named Garvin, we're getting married, I'm shutting down the school. In August, she signed her monthly reports from the school she's running, which is about to shut down, Mrs. John L. Denman. And I'll bring you up the, uh, the images here that I have of her monthly report from earlier in the summer and late in the summer, and you'll be able to see that this signature matches. Mary J. Richards becomes Mrs. John L. Denman. Hmm, that's interesting. Now, as far as the historical record goes, until very recently, that was the end. The mystery, she kind of just disappeared into the mists. 
of uh, what happened after that summer. Who knows? Nobody knows. Only very recently, for me, about a year ago, this letter showed up. And the last thing I have is a letter that arrives right here to this corner, to the home of Elizabeth Van Loo in 1870. It came from 30 Bedford Street in New York City. It's dated October 31st, addressed to my dear Miss Bet and uh, signed yours affectionately, M.J. Denman. Uh, this is a letter. Um, the summary basically is Mary Jane Denman has been offered by Miss Van Loo to come back and live in Richmond. And she's giving her reasons for not coming back. She's gonna stay in New York. She uh, received some money from Ms. Van Loo. She's explaining how she spent it. Um, she's saying, I don't wanna come back. And she's saying, I don't wanna have roommates. I'm a woman now, she says, 30 years of age and very quiet, rather peculiar. I could not stay in the room with anyone else. It would worry me to death. Um, she also says, I then reconsidered the past. If I ever came to your house, she said, and you ever told me what you had done for me, I should wish myself anywhere else except there. And during my stay there before, I was often the source of trouble and you often reminded me of all your kindness. Now, Ms. Vett, if I could do anything to show you my gratitude, I would do it, but that is impossible. So she is saying in this letter, I am prepared to make it on my own. I would rather, she's ultimately saying, uh, be on my own in New York City as a woman, 30 years of age, making my own way in the world. She says here that she's bought a sewing machine, she's paying it off in installments and do sewing for people. She says that she's going to the teacher's school and asks uh, Miss Van Lu to send her teacher's certificate. Um, she says, it would be unwomanly of me to become so dependent on anyone, yet I must do as many others have done before, try to support myself. Um, and finally, she says, I hope you will not lose sight of me, because I cannot bear the thought that no one is interested in my well or woe. Um, this letter is effectively a goodbye. She is severing ties. Um, Elizabeth Van Loo is gonna stay in Richmond for the rest of her life, for better or for worse, what Richmond becomes, Elizabeth Van Loo has cast in her lot with this community. Mary Richards has said goodbye. She's put Richmond in the rearview mirror. Now, I don't know what happens after this. I hope we'll find out more. I cannot tell you whether she stayed in New York. I cannot tell you whether she ever got married again. You'll note that this letter's coming from MJ Denman in New York, uh, living with roommates from Princeton, not living with Mr. Denman. He's out of the picture. What happens to her right now? I don't know. Um, how much longer she lives after this? I don't know. Where she might be buried? I don't know. Yet, there's more uh, to keep looking for, obviously. What makes this letter right now so remarkable and so useful is it gives us some more avenues to explore, some more clues to follow, especially considering uh, the story of these two women and their relationship. They're in the same place at the same time, pursuing the same historical goal, and yet their experiences must be completely different. History answers questions a lot, but it also leaves us with questions to contemplate ourselves. What do these two women have in common? Uh, what ways are their lives completely different, even in the same house? How might their motivations for fighting the Confederacy be different? How would they envision a society in Richmond without slavery, or what their two experiences might lead them to uh, after the war? There's not really any telling what we're gonna find out next. This whole thing is a process. And you know, sometimes when I'm doing tours and working at the visitor center, somebody kind of hits me with the, they'll say, you're being a revisionist historian. And you know, if we weren't revising because we wanted to keep learning more, what's the point, right? There's a term that I use proudly. We're revising because I keep looking and I keep finding new stuff. Uh, if we didn't revise our history, we wouldn't know that this fascinating person that we've been talking about today ever existed at all. If we stopped in 1911, we'd have a fake name that you'd never find anything about and the story would be over. Um, so historians out there, if you're a historian, if you're a history enthusiast, if you're people who just wanna keep knowing about the legacy and honoring the legacy of the people who came before you, don't ever stop revising. So that's the story. We've answered the basic question of this tour. Who was Mary Jane Richards? She was an educated woman. She was a world traveler. She was a teacher. She was not a soft-spoken activist. She was an active actor in dissenting in racist Virginia before and during and after the Civil War. Did she work in Jefferson Davis's house? 
Probably not. Did she go into Jefferson Davis's house during the war? Possibly. Was she a Union spy? Yes. One of many. She is a black Union spy in Richmond. She is not the black Union spy in Richmond. Uh, there are other local names that will come up when you dig. Uh, William Brisby, Thomas Fox, Robert Ford at Libby Prison. Oh, man. <laughs> Wait till uh, I get a chance to do this tour coming up. Uh, the story of Robert Ford here is just amazing. There are more names to find. There are more stories to hear about uh, and tell. What I've set out to do here is tell you the start of one person's story. You now know as much as just about anybody about the facts of who this person was, where she was, and what she did. I can share this with you, but it's not up to me to tell you what it means. Whatever your connection is to this story, why it resonates, that's what gives this story its power. Uh, history belongs to all of us. All of us have the ability to keep uh, researching, keep digging. Uh, I welcome all of you that are here to keep telling this story, keep making it powerful, and join me in always finding out more.